Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and our first Aviation Outlook webinar of the new year. I'm Alan Stolzer, Dean of the College of Aviation at the Daytona Beach campus. We are glad you could join us. For the spring semester, we'll be producing a new Aviation Outlook about once every four to six weeks. And by popular demand, we've moved the start time to 7 p.m. Eastern. Tonight, we are pleased to be visiting with Yvette Rhodes, Senior Vice President for the Cargo Airline Association. The CAA is responsible for representing the industry before federal and state regulatory bodies, the United States Congress, and in the federal and state courts. Yvette spe specializes in monitoring regulatory activity in the safety and security areas, and she participates in government and industry working groups. She started her career with the CAA in 1994. In welcoming President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris to their new positions, CAA President Steve Alterman spoke of the air cargo industry saying, and this is an extensive quote, but I think it, it frames our discussion this evening, Quote, air cargo transports over $6 trillion worth of goods annually, accounting for approximately 35% of world trade by value. The industry directly employs over 1.4 million people nationwide, and several more million are employed in connection to the global supply chain. Every state and city in our nation is supported by air cargo, either directly by an air cargo carrier, indirectly by industries that support air cargo, and by industries that rely on air cargo. Our members have responded to the COVID-19 crisis by transporting critical PPE and medical supplies to first responders and hospitals, while also delivering essential goods to every community across the country. Additionally, air cargo has been and will continue to be a key component of our nation's recovery from COVID-19, end quote. Air cargo carriers are also delivering millions of doses of vaccines to all 50 states, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and to U.S. service members abroad in, co in coordination with healthcare professionals and the federal government. Yvette earned degrees from the University of Maryland School of Business and the Capital University Law School. In 2017, she was appointed chair of the Federal Aviation Administration's Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee. And we will talk with her about her responsibilities as chair as well. She also serves as the president of the Aero Club Foundation of Washington which fosters the principles and development of aviation, aeronautics, and the science of aerodynamics by establishing and sponsoring educational programs at public and charter schools in the District of Columbia. Yvette is also passionate about increasing the awareness of and interest in careers in the aviation and aerospace industries among girls and underrepresented minorities. Yvette Rose, welcome to Aviation Outlook. Thank you for joining us. How are you this evening? Great, Dean Stolzer, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Um, I wanted to first off thank you and your team for inviting me to speak here tonight about the air cargo industry, um, including Professor and Associate Dean Friedenazon, who I have the pleasure to serve on ARAC with. Um, I hope I can help inform your students on this really critical segment of aviation. And Absolutely. thanks for your opening remarks. Absolutely, thank you and uh, we've been really looking forward to this discussion. So let's dive right in. Absolutely. So the uh, passenger side of the airline industry has been operating significantly fewer flights during the public health crisis. Uh, but air cargo is different. Between March and early December, uh, FedEx delivered over 2 billion face and surgical masks, 55 kilotons of personal protective equipment, and almost 10,000 humanitarian aid shipments uh, to support the global response to COVID-19 to date. UPS moved over 24 million pounds of PPE and distributed millions of diagnostic test kits and biologic samples for COVID-19. 
My sense is that the cargo industry was well prepared to play its role during this crisis. Can you talk about the industry's important role in transporting much needed supplies around the world during this pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, our members have played an integral role in the transportation of critical medical supplies, PPE. You know, the numbers you, you stated there are truly astounding. Uh, we have the um, experience and, uh, and the ability to adapt our networks to meet this demand. Um, you know, in air cargo, we have you know peak season is is a term we we refer to. It typically follows you know the holiday shipping season. So runs from early November through the month of January into early February uh, 2020, just barely outside of our peak season, uh, this global pandemic hits. Um, we are faced with an incredible demand for PPE, you know, medical supplies. As states with their stay at home orders, um, more people are ordering online for their you know, food, their daily household goods. So, pushed our uh, industry right back into peak season. We, we're, still, we're still in it, um, but Air Cargo really has the, uh, you know, the access to markets and the ability to connect uh, worldwide markets truly like no other. You know, our members have connectivity to every zip code in the US. So uh, we were called upon to, to serve and we were um, you know, extremely essential um, facing this demand, um, you know, limited supply, especially in the US. So in order to really um, respond appropriately and act swiftly, we had to prioritize the, the types of cargo that uh, were shipped first. So obviously um, prioritizing PPE, medical supplies, ensuring that, um, you know, they got to where they needed to go while still dealing with a great increased volume of cargo. Um, during this time, e-commerce, um, we've always seen e-commerce as a market that uh, is, you know, projected to grow. Certainly 2020 levels uh, were unprecedented, but as more and more people were having to order everything online, um, we had a shift in, you know, what was a very profitable market, you know, a business to business relationship really shifted to business to residential customers. Uh, that means an adapting, you know, that means more homes, more addresses, more delivery drivers, more um, boxes in our system. So it, it's that kind of, um, you know, uh, adaptability that we have, the networks in place, our operational experience dealing in peak seasons. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective on, on some data points regarding e-commerce specifically, um, DHL just, just put out some numbers. They recently experienced around 35% e-commerce volume growth in 2020 in their network. And they expect that those peak season numbers um, as they're about to come in will result in qu um, shipment quantities 50% higher than last year's peak season. So that, that's staggering. Um, at Atlas Air, you know, they, they operate um, the world's largest fleet of 747 freighter aircraft. And um, they recently announced they're ordering four new Boeing 747, you know, Dash 8 freighters to meet the demand, particularly in the e-commerce and express um, shipments markets. So we've had to rethink, we've had to adapt. Um, I think, and, and I know we talked about this earlier, the, the public's awareness of, of this critical segment of the industry has been really encouraging. And I think has um, sort of given everyone a renewed, you know, sense of our importance and vigor, um, you know, to see on a worldwide scale, our flight crew, um, our delivery drivers, our employees getting the, the kind of recognition, you know, on, on social media, hashtag air cargo matters and, you know, the, the kindness being, you know, treated as, as heroes in the response effort really has been um, extremely encouraging for us. And I'm, I'm so proud of our industry. Um, and again, it's sort of just reflecting back as, you know, I've, I've been in this industry a while and, and just thinking of its history, um, you know, getting a shipment overnight when this uh, industry first launched um, was some, something sort of a, as a luxury, if you, if you think about it, really only reserved for, you know, maybe important documents or a package that had to be there overnight. Now it's common. You know, you order something online, you, you don't want to wait more than, more than a day to, to get your product. So... We've seen that shift, and, and again, we've had the operational experience, but it's we're something extremely proud of um, in our in our response and and in the aid and the recovery. So, those, those really are staggering numbers when you talk about thirty five percent, fifty percent 
uh, truly a remarkable response by the, uh, by the industry. Um, I also know that uh, air cargo volumes improved uh, toward the end of 2020, uh, but the industry is still facing a reduction in so-called belly capacity uh, due to the decline in capacity by the passenger carriers. Uh, how has the air cargo industry responded to that? Yeah, and I, and I probably should have started off. I, I assume you know your students and your audience here tonight understands. You know we represent the U.S. all cargo air carriers, so it's those carriers that operate um, just freighter aircraft. But um, you know, cargo is carried in the bellies of of passenger planes, um, and that's right. You know, the passenger carriers with with COVID face dramatic decreases in passenger airline traffic, you know, upwards of 80 to 90% drops in capacity. It's, um, you know, staggering and, and really sad to see, um, forcing them to ground aircraft, you know, cut their capacity, furlough employees. But, and this resulted in a 53% decrease in belly capacity from last year. That That is a lot of cargo that needs to get um, where it needs to go. And and many, many um, people might not realize in, when you look at air freight worldwide, only about 40% of cargo is carried on all cargo aircraft. So there is a lot of cargo that goes in the bellies of passenger planes. Um, again, we also utilize passenger aircraft, by the way, um, you know, the belly space to, um, in our peak season um, flight. So the whole entire logistics supply chain had to, be completely um, re revamped and, and, and renewed and ensure that we can find cargo space on freighter aircraft. You know, many of our members brought any airplanes that they had, you know, running it again at 100% capacity. Um, we had to prioritize the type of cargo that needs to go out first. Um, I think having the role of, you know, being a critical infrastructure, being deemed essential, again, the, the renewed importance of the critical nature of the markets that we need to serve and then how we were responding to COVID really assisted in, in the efforts. Um, you know, we have that operational experience. Um, we also, you know, have to make sure we do it safely. Uh, safety is our, our top priority. So, um, you know, that doesn't just mean the safety of our, you know, aircraft and our operations, but it's really the health and safety of our employees. So, you know, I just, we can, we could not have done this and are doing this without our, our employees. That's, you know, our flight crew, ground workers, you know, delivery drivers, all of our essential workers. Um, but in the beginning with so much uncertainty about the virus, it was extremely important for our members to engender that sense of trust that our employees are being protected and their health and safety is first and foremost. So, uh, you know, we have multiple layers of safety, pre-flight screening, you know, aircraft cleaning and disinfecting, um, obviously, you know, of course, providing, you know, PPE, but uh, many of the challenges too was not only, you know, kind of rethinking the entire logistics supply chain, but we were faced with um, different restrictions, uh, border closures, quarantines. I mean, there's still, you know, the potential for those kinds of things. So having to reroute aircraft, the last thing we want was for our crew to be stuck um, in a foreign location due to a quarantine or, or, you know, some new testing protocol that was in place. So that, that was a challenge as well. Um, so I think that, you know, we're continuing to evolve and learn. We've, we've learned a lot about how we can, you know, operate in, in this environment. Um, and we've never stopped evolving. You know, we've made significant investments in automation and technology to be able to do what, what we do, to be able to be as nimble and resilient as we've been. So um, I see that, that that too is sort of something that we're going to continue to do and, and automate and, and technology to be able to, to really account for the um, tremendous demand that there is for air cargo. Excellent. It really sounds like the workers rose to the occasion though. And yeah. In a very demanding situation. Um, Yvette, I read an article recently that estimated that coronavirus vaccine distribution will add just 2% to global air cargo demand. Uh, clearly the cargo carriers have played an important role in the distribution of the vaccine. Uh, can you explain or talk about some of the complexities associated with transporting vaccines and dry ice and other conditions such as that? Yes, so now our priority has shifted to vaccines. Um, for this particular vaccine, we've been preparing for, for months. Uh, 
but really our members have years of experience in healthcare logistics. We're, we're leaders in healthcare logistics. We know how to carry temperature sensitive cargo. Um, we, but I will say this worldwide distribution of this scale uh, was, is truly unprecedented. So, um, you know, I, I can go through a little bit about each of the vaccines that are currently, if, if it would be of interest, um, just because I think there's a lot of sure. you know, uncertainty in, in terms yeah. of what, what's out there and how we're, you know, safely carrying this stuff. But, um, you know, Pfizer and Moderna, they're both currently the approved vaccines on the market. They both require a temperature control. The Pfizer vaccine is, is the one you refer to that um, has to be transported with dry ice because it has to be kept at minus 75 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's super cold. <laughs> and yes, it does require the dry ice. Uh, the Moderna one actually um, needs to just be maintained at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So it doesn't need dry ice. Moderna, when they package the vaccines, they use these specialized gel packs for the transportation. Um, for the Pfizer, each package that Pfizer puts together, each one holds 23 kilograms or a little over 50 pounds of dry ice in each box. Um, each packs, pack or package is only good for about five days at two to eight degrees Celsius, which is your typical refrigeration after you remove them from dry ice. So that's why they need to be um, used fairly quickly and we have to transport them obviously very quickly as well. Um, they're packaged with the intent of um, that the containers can only be opened two times per day for five minutes each. So it to withdraw the vials. So again, the temperature sensitivity for something like that um, was, you know, is, is of top importance. For Moderna, um, their packages are good for 12 hours at minus 25, but once defrosted, they're good for 30 days at the two to eight degrees Celsius. So we're seeing two more vaccines that are likely going to be coming on the market, hopefully, you know, applying for emergency use authorization um, in the near term. That's uh, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca. Um, from what we know to date, uh, neither one will require dry ice. So um, that, that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, still we, we have to wait and see, you know, the potential for other vaccines um, or, you know, where, where the process is in terms of what they require. Um, the vaccine manufacturers had to have the confidence to know that the, their product was going to be, you know, maintain the temperature throughout their entire supply chain from the pickup to the destination point um, to prepare. Um, not only were our members, you know, in collaboration and in discussions with not only the government, but the, directly with the aircraft manufacturer or the uh, vaccine manufacturers and our aircraft manufacturers. But we've also been increasing our cold chain capacity. So that means that um, we're making investments in cold chain storage because we have you know, carried the flu vaccine. We know what it's like to have um, temperature sensitivity and cargo. And um, you know, FedEx, for example, has more than 90 cold chain facilities across five continents you know, with plans to continue to open more. So we were a little bit ahead because we've, we've done this, but again, on this scale. Um, and the FedEx cold chain center in Memphis can, um, you know, has 20,000 square feet of temperature controlled storage. So again, we, we're, we're prepared, but um, in 2020, FedEx um, transported approximately 500,000 dry ice shipments per month. UPS has the capability at its facilities to make its own dry ice, which is pretty wow. incredible. I thought that would be a pretty interesting um, mm -hmm. tidbit of information there and it can produce up to 1200 pounds of dry ice per hour in its oh, wow. US facilities. Yeah. yeah, because at a certain point we were talking about, is there gonna be a shortage of dry ice or you know, um, that kind of thing. But, um, and you talked a little bit about in your question about the safety aspects of, of dry ice. So I can get into that a little bit as well. Um, dry ice is a classified hazardous material. So it requires a lot of you know, safety measures, regulatory precautions, um, packaging, labeling, handling, transporting. So, um, and you know, the reason dry ice as it um, is stands for a period of time passes and it's exposed to different ambient temperatures, it goes through a chemical change known as sublimation. So the dry ice will release CO2 
obviously CO2 in a closed aircraft environment is not <laughs> what, you, what you want. So that's the um, reason for the, the safety um, approach and the um, strict you know, regulations and precautions. That doesn't mean we can't carry dry ice. We just have to make sure we have the measures in place to do it safely. Um, some of those measures include CO2 sensors um, on the aircraft, um, could even be worn by the pilots um, and crew members. The sensors would let the crew members know if there's um, you know, a hazardous condition in the environment um, you know, with any sort of release of CO2 inside the aircraft. Our pilots are trained on these specific conditions to ensure that you know, their decision-making in the event of CO2 detector alert um, goes off. So again, I think it's our experience in, in carrying um, these kinds of shipments, our commitment to safety um, that we've allowed, uh, you know, been successful in carrying um, the vaccines. And, you know, uh, we can pretty much assume now that almost every one of our flights has, has vaccines on it, or, or certainly the supplies that are needed to get vaccines um, into arms. So it's the vials, the syringes, the gloves. Um, aircraft manufacturers also, you know, they play a part too in when they, you know, um, certificate and configure a cargo compartment with the proper safety measures in place and accounting for potentially carrying any hazardous material. So they've, um, they started doing a lot of tests on dry ice sublimation and where, you know, where are the limits here? What do, what do we, you know, we want to ensure that we um, don't just fill up an aircraft, an entire aircraft with, you know, each box containing 50 pounds, multiply that out. That's, that's a lot of dry ice. Um, and the FAA's tech center in Atlantic City too. So if any one of your students is interested in some really cool tests, they published it on the FAA website has um, specifically for vaccine transport. I think it's fa.gov slash coronavirus vaccine underscore transport. But they even went down to the different pellet sizes of dry ice. So really, you know, kind of cool, cool stuff and, and making sure again, it's our commitment to safety, both the government and industry partnering together. Um, FAA released a SAFO or safe alert guidance for dry ice. Um, and, you know, we're again, focused on the system safety approach to, to you know, an SMS, um, which I don't know if, you know, you're familiar with, but it, you know, requires you to have, if you're presented with a risk or a hazard, you analyze that risk, um, you know, assess the, the safety um, analysis that goes into it and then um, have the appropriate safety measures put in place. Um, and that's really the, the, what we've done on every step regarding the vaccines. Um, and it also takes a lot of collaboration really ahead of the approval process. This was going on way before the vaccines were approved. So bottom line, we are, um, it has presented clearly some logistical challenges, but we're, you know, uniquely suited to handle them. Um, and, you know, it, it's, uh, it's been extremely rewarding to be able to be part of this effort. Uh, we've gotten pretty good reviews from, from the manufacturers and they're, they're very pleased with the way um, the transportation, at least part of it's going. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, that's an exciting part of, part of the response. Yeah, that's really remarkable. And uh, just listening to you describe it, it's really kind of a case study in logistics and planning that would be suitable for a college course, I would imagine. You took the words right out of my mouth as I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, it's it would be something to really go back and look at, especially at the success stories and, at, you know, the success and how, how we did it. Um, because, you know, we were in it, we were having meetings and, and trying to figure out all the potential um, pitfalls and, and concerns and working with the agency and the HHS and everybody at the table. Um, but really to now be where we are, I mean, we're not, you know, there yet, but we're, we're getting there. It's, it's, it's quite a remarkable thing. I think it would be a really interesting, you know, deep dive look into it. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that's well documented for uh, future uh, planning and and uh, learning going forward. Hopefully we don't have to deal with something exactly like this in the future, but, uh, but it would, you know, we should take those lessons learned, lessons learned and really uh, uh, make them part of what, the, what our planning is all about. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So some of our airports uh, that serve as large cargo hubs in this country, uh, and some of those I think are also associate members of, the, of your organization, uh, they've become much busier during this time. How have they responded to the pandemic? 
Um, yeah, you know, our airport, especially our large cargo hub airports, um, they're our partners and have been all the way. They, we can't, you know, do this without them. They have made huge investments to in their infrastructure to ensure that cargo operates safely and efficiently. Um, you know, in 2019, the top five cargo airports by landed weight um, were Memphis, Anchorage, uh, Louisville, Miami, and LA, followed closely by Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky um, International Airport or CVG. Um, so I don't know if you're also following what's happening at CVG, but it's quite interesting to see, you know, the role of Amazon Prime Air and Amazon Air Hubs. Um, you know, they have, I believe their first phase is, is 650 acres worth, you know, with mm -hmm. plans to move. So that's another kind of interesting case study. But um, you know, yes, the many of the predominantly large cargo hub airports have been booming throughout the pandemic, um, and it, it's a also a rewarding feeling. We've able to keep those airport workers employed. Um, you know, it's they've been partners with us um, along the way, ensuring that we can operate safely and efficiently as we're continuing to stay in this in this um, you know 100% capacity environment. Um, there's also some airports where they're literally surviving because of cargo. Um, seeing such a drop in passenger traffic has really impacted the airports. Um, so again, I think we're seeing a lot of renewed um, sense of importance for cargo outreach to our cargo tenants at those airports. Um, share with you some other statistics from other cargo airports like Ontario in California. They were down more than 50% in passenger traffic, but up 18% year over year in cargo. So they were already starting to see that that potential for cargo to be, you know, in the growing segment of their um, um, tenants. But um, this past June, Ontario just, you know, put out their numbers for seeing a 30% increase in cargo over June the previous year. So beating their 18% record, 30%. Um, and I know Rockford International Airport is another one that's tracking how much, um, you know, PPE and cargo is, is going through their system. During the first quarter of 2020, they had uh, 625 million pounds of PPE and other goods mm -hmm. cross the tarmac at Rockford. So, these airports may not have been used to this kind of level of cargo, but again, you know, everyone's stepping up, and um, we're just extremely grateful to our airport partners. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, passenger carrier carriers and a reduction in flights, uh, and that's certainly been uh, very significant. Um, and uh, you know, some because of that, some additional flying opportunities arose for air cargo carriers, uh, including some at uh, slot-controlled airports like New York's JFK. And I know your organization urged the FAA to make those unused flight slots available for the cargo industry. Uh, can you talk about that initiative and the uh, important role that that uh, CAA plays in? advocating really for the broader needs of the air cargo industry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the issue like the SOT allocation you brought up um, in um, all the SOT controlled airports, not just New York JFK, but it's just one example of how um, trade associations advocate for, advocate for their members and the industry. Um, in that particular issue, um, we, you know, there were slots, there are slots that are being unused or underutilized um, that were reserved for passenger carriers. So we, we just urge the FAA to consider a temporary reallocation of those slots for cargo. Um, this is in no way to, um, you know, stand in the way of any relief FAA is going to grant the passenger carriers because we understand they're hurting. It's again, I think, just a way to um, help, you know, the agency and the and the public so awareness of the importance of cargo. So um, it's been received positively, um, and and we'll continue to. To you know, it, we hope that the passenger industry comes back and, and they're able to get um, you know out of this. But um, in the meantime, I know FAA has put in some relief measures. Um, and just on the broader uh, question about advocating for for our members and and specifically for air cargo, it's it's been it's such an interesting shift now with COVID because um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to you know remind our policymakers, regulators, and lawmakers that 
you know, FedEx, UPS, Atlas, ABX Air, we're all part 121 um, certificated airlines. Like if we're commercial airlines and we're not, you know, any other, it's, it's, we're still part 121 certificates. Um, each one of our members is unique. You know, not only are we different from the passenger carriers, completely different operations and business model, but even among our members, uh, it, it, it's their, vastly different operations, um, you know, like a FedEx or UPS integrated carriers. That's, you know, they're known as integrated carriers. They have aircraft, they have ground service. They really focus on that point to point um, from, you know, point of um, shipment to the point of destination. And they have express, you know, shipments and, and various levels of service. Um, then you have um, you know, companies like Atlas, um, Kalita, you know, ABX Air that um, they may focus more on on-demand or charter. Their biggest customer may be DHL or Amazon or the Postal Service or the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. So um, they may just only provide the aircraft, the crew, the maintenance and the insurance. Those are ACMI, full freighters, but the, you know, lease they lease the shipping um, customer will lease space on an aircraft on a you know freighter aircraft so it's different than a passenger carrier but still we're you know part 121 certificate so um you know it, it in terms of advocating i think you know you just have to kind of understand the complexities um uh, and be able to to um advocate for your members and one thing they do have in common obviously is that um and we're seeing this you know firsthand is we're major contributors to the US economy. We create jobs. That's just, you know, it's extremely important for policymakers to, to know this and have the recognition that, you know, we employ upwards of 1.5 million people worldwide. I think these may be some of the same statistics you started with, as um, you know, you noted, we're always advocating and ensuring that policymakers understand the value and the importance of our, our members to the economy, to jobs. Um, and to the U.S. And, and really to the world. So we're um, continuing to do that as an association. I think it's fair to say your, uh, your association represents a lot more people than most people would, would estimate. Um, I'd like to slip in a question if I can about drones. Uh, during the spring of 19, UPS partnered with Matternet uh, to operate a logistics service that provides delivery of time and temperature sensitive medicines and supplies. And more recently, this includes PPE for medical professionals treating COVID-19 patients. Uh, FedEx is also working with Wing Aviation on a drone delivery initiative in Virginia. Do you have a sense as to how the air cargo industry will continue to adopt this technology to optimize their delivery capabilities? And how do you anticipate that will transform the air cargo industry? Yeah, drones are truly exciting part of um, the next evolution of air cargo delivery. Um, they really offer uh, innovative, you know, last mile transport. Um, that's really kind of how we're looking at it. Really have the potential for humanitarian aid. Um, really have you know potential for disaster relief, transport of temperature sensitive um, cargo as well, um, medicine and food. Um, definitely, the near future of drones is I think going to be focused on that last mile of transportation and medical supplies. Um, the two programs you mentioned are examples of this, but also, you know, um, UPS partnering with CVS to deliver essentials to that large retirement community in Florida. Um, it really was intending to reduce the human um, contact during the pandemic. So again, opportunities for, for drones to assist in these efforts. Um, we are so in, very much investing and in watching the drone um, you know, take over uh, on entrance into cargo, there are, you know, complications that need to be worked out and some issues that need to be worked out that I think we're going to have um, in the near term. The technology is far outpacing regulations in this space. You know, FAA is doing what it can. I know it has a drone advisory committee and they, before the end of 2020, put out a couple of, of drone rules that I know that, that um, 
folks in this space were, were really waiting on, but the regulatory reform is slow. And I think technology is, is far outpacing that. So that, that's an issue that we have to be concerned with. I think the other is um, airspace, um, pro, you know, issues with airspace and noise. You know, drone, we, we have always heard, you know, aircraft noise issues and that, that hasn't gone away, but certainly drones will bring a whole new level of um, noise and environmental concerns with, with the public that is, are gonna have to be addressed. You know, it's not just gonna be at an airport or surrounding an airport. But um, it's a really exciting thing. And I know for your students, um, you know, to be on the cusp and to be getting into an industry right when, when there's so many innovations is, is really exciting. Absolutely. We have, uh, we have uh, very robust uh, U, uh, unmanned programs really across the university. So we're, we're excited about that technology and the continued development of it. Yeah, for sure. But I, uh, uh, I hear you, the challenges with uh, regulation, airspace, and noise are all significant mm -hmm. uh, things we're going to have to deal with going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. um, Yvette, your career has led you to a unique uh, position to observe the growth of the air cargo sector, which you've been doing for some time. Uh, what are two or three things that you've learned along the way uh, that has helped you succeed in this dynamic industry? I love that question, Dean Stolzer. That's that's a great one. Um, the two things that, that come to mind um, are communication and relationships. Um, in my position, being an advocate for an industry uh, that not only means understanding the issues and but it means being able to effectively communicate, uh, you know, on behalf of our members. Um, and I just don't mean, you know. I mean specifically um, good written communication skills. They're still vitally important. I know that you know we're we're seeing social media. Um, you know we learn to communicate via text, via character limitations, but you still have to have really good written communication skills. And so I would encourage your students to continue to hone those. You know your English classes are are really important because when you're faced with a complex issue, whether it's you know, commenting on a particular rule or, or policy or law, or trying to communicate a plan you wanna have put in place within your company or organization, you really have to still be able to effectively communicate. So um, you know, we really focus on, on that at the association. Um, and so that, that's my first sort of uh, lesson or, or you know, advice is the communication. Um, the other piece, relationships. Um, and I say that because, you know, with any idea or any issue, um, you're going to be faced with multiple viewpoints and you're going to have to collaborate. You know, we nothing gets done successfully without collaboration. And in order to have that, you have to have those relationships in place. You have to be the one that they know to come to on an issue. Um, the aviation is incredibly small community. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Uh, once you, you know, and once you're in aviation, you never leave. You might, you might switch, you know, to a different part of aviation, but but you're not going to leave. So, um, I think one of the examples of this, you know, most recently is is the vaccine effort. Without the ability to collaborate well in advance of the vaccine being approved, be able to get. Um, have the relationships that we have with the government, the our industry partners, aircraft manufacturers, everyone that played a part, um, and our employees, and we would not have, you know, been able to be so successful. So, it's focusing on the relationships um, and then the need to collaborate on issues. So, I, I, I'm convinced that the government industry working groups that you talked about, the advisory committees that are in place that we serve on um, really are successful because it allows us that opportunity to maintain relationships, collaborate on issues, and you know, in the end, we'll, we'll enhance safety because of it. It is tremendous advice. Uh, com communications and rate of relationships uh, are so important and uh, often undervalued. And I'm glad you mentioned both of those. Um, the aviation industry often attracts people who are passionate about aviation. How did you personally end up in the industry? 
I wish I had a great story to tell you. And I just sort of fell into it. So I'm one of those. Um, I will say I, in school, I loved to research. I was um, completely taken with laws and regulations and how they were uh, applied. And aviation happens to have a whole lot of rules. We are a really regulated industry. So um, it's, I, it's incredibly dynamic, you know, changing and evolving. So I stayed in and I love it, but I, I wish I could say I had this passion for aviation before, um, but you know, I've stayed. So th that's clear that I, I do love it. Absolutely. <laughs> I've also heard you have a passion for men uh, mentoring young people. Uh, I suspect that some of our Embry-Riddle students and others watching uh, tonight would be eager to hear about the roles that mentors played in your own career. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I am feel most rewarded uh, when I give back and help young people uh, find their path, um, help them succeed in, in whatever, you know, path is right for them, you know, really make them aware of the vast opportunities that there are in aviation, you know, it's not just pilots and mechanics. So I really, um, especially young men and women in underrepresented groups, I, I definitely um, have a passion for, for giving back and, and making them aware that they are our next generation of aviation leaders. So I am very fortunate that the president of the Cargo Airline Association, Steve Alterman, is extremely supportive of my work with young people. Um, he's certainly been a mentor to me. Um, you know, mentors, will support you along your way, help you charter your own path. You don't necessarily have to fit into a certain mold. I think that, um, you know, being a female in a male dominated industry certainly presented some presents some challenges, but especially as a young female, um, really trying to navigate my way into this aviation profession, it, it wasn't always easy. So I really tried to find people in my, you know, that were, similar to me, you know, other women in aviation, raising children, having a family. Um, I think that that kind of support was really important, especially, you know, early in my career when, when you know, we all kind of had to support each other. Um, I always try to seek out people with similar interest, you know, because then you can have an authenticity. You don't have to change who you are. You, you know, authenticity is, you know, the best approach and really helps too when you're building relationships with people. If you're, if you're authentic, um, then I think that's going to, you know, carry you pretty far and, and, and succeed. So I think that's going to help give the credibility to, you know, your students along the way. So that, that's kind of my advice I would give. Excellent. That's great <laughs> advice. We've talked about some uh, statistics um, throughout our conversation, but I'd like to throw out a couple others and, and uh, ask you uh, about that. The, the economic impact of aviation is really significant. Uh, in Florida, where I am, the air cargo industry supports more than 625,000 jobs and creates more than $4 billion in revenue. Um, we all know government policies can foster continued growth for this sector. Uh, in 2019, the Bipartisan Air Cargo Caucus was formed in Congress. If you would elaborate a little about the caucus and its priorities going forward. Absolutely, happy to. Yes, the Air Cargo Caucus was formed in 2019. Um, it aims to uh, recognize the vital contributions of air cargo, um, you know, promoting an understanding within Congress. So, you know, air cargo is in every state, locality, district, every congressional member, um, you know, can have, is touched by air cargo. So the caucus is an opportunity to ensure that members of Congress understand the vital importance of cargo to their district. Um, it's, uh, we have, it's a bipartisan caucus, so both Republicans and Democrats um, with over 40 members currently. We have events and opportunities for congressional members to interact and, and learn um, about what our industry is doing. Um, you know, we're really just promoting and ed educating, not necessarily advocating for a specific issue or position, but it's really ensuring that we, you know, make them aware and um, on the special, you know, um, impact that cargo carriers and, and the increase the visibility and importance of cargo. Um, yeah, cargo is a job creator. And, you know, you, you mentioned some numbers in your question. Um, during 2020, you know, our member companies obviously were continuing to hire full-time, part-time, seasonal, 
we've um, provided good jobs in districts all across America, hiring over 200,000 people um, during this pandemic and we're continuing to hire. So it, it's, a, it's a great segment and the caucus has just allowed us the opportunity to really direct connect with members of Congress on the importance of Air Cargo. Excellent. Uh, you've been in the industry long enough to have seen a few ups and downs. What makes you optimistic about the future? Uh, well, you know, this uh, growth in e-commerce, the ability to, uh, this global economy really depends on our industry. Um, you know, we got to have high quality products at, at competitive prices offered to consumers worldwide and, and air cargo can, can provide that. Um, again, you know, we're seeing this huge boom in e-commerce, but I think to one piece of the industry that um, may not be getting as much focus right now, but certainly, you know, in this new administration is our efforts in sustainability and the environment. Um, it's really incredible things. Another thing for your students to look at what some of our members are doing in, in regarding sustainable aviation fuel. Um, Atlas Air announced the completion of a transoceanic sustainable aviation fuel test flight originating from Spain. Um, this flight was powered by a blend of 2.33% um, sustainable fuel sourced from fresh vegetable oil. So mm -hmm. again, really innovative, cool things happening. Um, the we're continuously investing in ways to lower our aircraft emissions um lighter unit load devices which are ulds which are basically you know the the things that get carried inside boxes go inside and then they get loaded on the aircraft but you know lightweight ulds um ways to automate um and technological advances um the i don't know if anyone's has in your audience has seen um toward an aircraft, uh, a US all cargo air carrier hub, but it is something to behold. <laughs> I would recommend a field trip to a, to a cargo sort facility. The automations in these in the hub are, is incredible. I first time I went to one, um, I was like, "There's no way my box will ever make it to its destination." It's it's pushed and pulled and by robotic arms, scanned by zip code, somehow tossed you know in an appropriate bin to be loaded on an aircraft. And in a, the sort facility and the express environment, particularly boxes aren't even touched by human hands. So. I think that there are so many opportunities for really cool technology, um, and you know, just I, that's why I'm optimistic about the future. We're we're going to continue to evolve. We're going to continue to be necessary, um, and and you know, we talked a little bit about the drones and and even the commercial space, all the new entrants that are coming. I, I am I am very optimistic about our future. Excellent. You know, I, I mentioned at the outset, uh, you have uh, some other activities you're involved in as well. Uh, in your spare time, you are the chair of the FAA's Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee. Uh, that committee is charged with providing advice and recommendations on a, a full range of aviation related issues in the development of regulations. Uh, it's called ARAC and it consists of 23 or so members uh, including my uh, colleague, uh, Daniel Friedenzone, you mentioned him earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and that represents organizations from uh, uh, across the aviation community, directly and indirectly impacted by FAA regulations. Just interested in hearing your thoughts on how the different parts of the industry come together to help the government enact policies that will benefit the traveling public, as Absolutely. well as, as, well yeah. as cargo. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it, it's not just cargo. You know, when I when I sit on that committee, I'm you know representing a constituency, but really looking at ways that the industry and government can collaborate to come up with you know sense sensible regulations. You know, the the ARAC as a body will receive taskings from the agency, um, and you know if they are accepted on a particular issue, a particular regulation that needs um, to be addressed. Um, we have seen in the last few congressional cycles, you know, Congress mandating some regulations. So that always throws the agency for a loop. But, um, you know, so some of them do go to ARAC, some of them may get directly to another, you know, committee that might take that issue on. But uh, if we do receive a tasking from the FAA to look at a specific uh, regulatory proposal, 
we establish a working group. So we get the subject matters, in, subject matter experts in the room to really dive deep um, into a potential rulemaking. So, it, you know, and it's not just cost benefit, it's really taking into account the operational uniqueness of the different um, interested parties and the affected parties uh, really before it gets to the rulemaking process because it takes years for rules to, to get um, issued. But if we can have some collaboration and, and find good sense policy before it goes out, um, I think that that makes for a better rule in the end. So it's it's been um, it's worked really well for a long time. I think the FAA is a really good agency in establishing these kinds of advisory committees. Um, you know, ARAC is, is a formal one. Um, we have the Commercial Aviation Safety Team CAST, which our association also sits on. Again, industry government partnership with the goal to you know enhance safety. So it's it's a really um, good collaborative process and and a lot of good things have come out of it um so it, it's it's good to be you know at the table <laughs> absolutely i i couldn't agree more and uh and i actually applaud the fa for taking those steps and having those committees in place because they really do benefit the uh the uh, greater society in our remaining time we have a couple of interesting questions that have come in from the uh from the audience Okay. Uh, so I'll just ask you three or four of these. Uh, what was the most valuable lesson learned by the cargo industry uh, during the year 2020? Hmm. Well, uh, I don't think we could have prepared really, you know, for what was to hit. But I think we have to, you know, learn the lesson we learned is to be able to adapt quickly. Um, the preparedness part, I think, is something that now we have the experience um, and, and we'll know what to do. But I think the biggest challenge early on was facing these global um, restrictions. And we've got to ensure that people look at our business as a global network, a global supply chain. Um, you know, I understand with, with the virus, you know, you had certain countries, you know, closing their borders potentially or putting into place all these rules, but I think we've got to have some common sense, um, global sort of perspectives, um, you know, God forbid this happens again, but you know, we have to, I think we can do ourselves a big favor if we ensure that there is an understanding that we're a global network of services. Um, you know, we have the ICAO, the um, International Civil Aviation Organization, but, and they do kind of look at aviation globally, but there's still um, other, you know, countries can still, they don't necessarily have to follow the standards that are put out by ICAO. So we've got to have, I think, a better sense of, of that. I think that that's a, that's a lesson that we can take away. Excellent. Um, in your opinion, Yvette, will the pilot shortage, think about our audience uh, watching tonight, will the <laughs> pilot shortage come back after the airlines get up and running again? Uh, yes, we, we still need the um, bright infusion of, of bright talent to our industry. We are going to need our pilots and especially cargo um, you know, you know, we're going to be growing and we know you're going to, we know you're going to, we're going to need pilots. Uh, we, we tend to get our, um, you know, pilot hires from the uh, regional, you know, um, there's regional air cargo carriers out there as well. So, you know, Empire is one of them, a couple others that we uh, serve as feeders to our uh, large cargo carriers. So, Yes, so we are going to be faced with not only a pilot shortage, mechanics, you know, all the aviation workers. Um, so yes, stand, keep 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 doing what you're doing, and and there will be a job for you. I promise. Absolutely, and it will, it will be across the workforce. Yes. Um, last question, and I think this is an interesting one, uh, audience member. What are the main optimization challenges to be solved in cargo op, uh, operations? Hmm. Optimization challenges. Um, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, the, the capacity that the, the aircraft, um, you know, we've got uh, 747s is our, our, our biggest, probably, you know, the freighter market, um, 777s. Um, again, looking at the global supply chain and, and how we're going to ensure that we serve every community. Um, 
So I think that that's you know going to be a challenge. You know, it used to be that uh, cargo carriers would take um, a passenger aircraft and run it through a whole bunch of conversions, and and it would be converted to to fit an aircraft um, a cargo um, model. But now we're buying straight freighters from from our aircraft manufacturers. So I think ensuring that um, you know as we look at the global international market for cargo, that's going to be something that our carriers are going to have to be, you know, fleet planning and that, that kind of thing is, is, is keeping up with e-commerce too, the volumes that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be um, a, a challenge, but a welcome one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Yvette, uh, this was really fascinating, a great conversation. Uh, a lot, I of, great, lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of great information on the cargo industry and some of your other activities. And I know I learned a lot and I know our audience did as well. So thank you so much for taking. Absolutely. It was my pleasure to be here with you. Very good. All right. Well, as a reminder, we'll be announcing our next webinar guest soon. So be on the lookout for that. And don't forget, you can watch a recap of any of our previous dozen webinars on Embry-Riddle's YouTube channel by going to our webpage and clicking on past presenters. That web address is erau.edu slash aviation hyphen outlook, or just Google Embry-Riddle Aviation Outlook. We also would appreciate your feedback on what you've liked and what you would like to see in the future. Our thanks once again to our guest, Yvette Rose, and to the many participants from around the world who joined us tonight. For everyone here at Embry-Riddle, we wish you a safe and prosperous 2021. Good night.